Hi, I'm uh, Eric Clarkson. I'm introducing our speaker today. Uh, Volker J. Sorger is an associate professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and the leader of the Integrated Nanophotonics Lab at the George Washington U University. He received his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and MS from UT Austin. His research focuses on integrated photonics and plasmonics and analog information processing such as programmable photonic circuits and neuromorphic computing. His work was recognized by the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, the Emma Wolf Prize from the Optical Society of America, the AFOSR Young Investigator Award, the Hegarty Innovation Prize, the National Academy of Sciences Paper of the Year Award, and both the Early Career and Outstanding Research Awards at GWU. He is the Editor-in-Chief of Nanophotonics and the OSA Division Chair for Optoelectronics and Photonics. He serves on the boards of the OSA and SPIE and is a senior member of IEEE, OSA, and SPIE. Uh, and uh, further details, if you're interested, are at his website, sorger.seas.gwu.edu. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Sorger here today. Thank you. Well, it's a, being, it's a great pleasure being uh, back here on the, on the West Coast and particularly the South. I heard it's a great time to be here, so I certainly enjoyed every minute of it so far. Uh, thank you very much for coming to this seminar today. And um, uh, well, uh, today I will talk about two parts. Um, one is about next generation optoelectronics, and the second one will be about analog photonic processors. And um, both of them um, are around the topic of heterogeneous photonics. And heterogeneous basically means, for instance, for the first topic, we take some new emerging material and we integrate them or co integrate them with um, silicon photonic structures. Um, and uh, see what we can get from there. Um, yes, so as an, uh, uh, a small disclosure down here, um, I have a quite a few topics I want to cover today about our, um, our group and our lab. Um, and um, I actually cut quite a few slides out of this. If any of this uh, is uh, interesting to you, we can, I would be most, more than happy to discuss them with you afterwards. Um, even today, I have nothing planned for this evening or uh, in, a, in, an, like in a teleconference or so next week or anytime later on. So, all right, let's get to it. Um, this is my lab. Um, we look into, um, we use integrated photonic structures and um, we use them mainly as, in passive, um, as a passive um, backbone for uh, devices like shown down here, where we, for instance, heterogeneously put new materials. This can be, for instance, two-dimensional materials. This can be transparent conductive oxides or phase change materials onto these photonic structures. And maybe build basic new, new devices. So this is basically something that we look on a device level, essentially. And something we're looking into is, for instance, adder devices, but also very high-speed devices. So we're looking at some new light matter interactions and new physics. I think on the right hand now, we are more recently exploring um, uh, computing engines, um, either neuromorphic computing, analog processors, and the ideas we use them for applications all the way, of like for machine learning, smart sensors. We have quite a few work actually with um, small and medium enterprises on SBARs and STTRs. We have several phase ones and a few phase twos now. Um, um, and we actually spun out, um, I spun out actually two months ago my own company as well. Right now it's basically more like a patent collection. We have like seven, 17 patents in that company that we basically bundle and we kind of like develop some of them further. Yeah, funding came from all these sources. The latest one is actually this one. This is the, um, this is the seal of the president of the United States. And I was uh, fortunate actually to, to win this, uh, this award uh, recently. And uh, this is not Donald Trump, obviously, you noticed. <laughs> this is uh, the White House Director for uh, Office of Science Technology Policy, um, Kevin Drogenmeier. Um, all right. So this is the entire team that I'm um, honored to present the work from. So the left is basically, uh, basically my team. And the right is our collaborators, uh, many in academia, in government, industry, um, mainly DOD uh, lab focus, NASA a little bit as well, NSA recently a little bit more as well, and then some companies, uh, HP, Omega Optics, Mellon Knox, et cetera, IBM. So at a very high level, here's basically my lab and my vision and my direction. Um, I'm really interested in information processing using light. 
I'm I originally I was a physicist um, before sort of converted to an electrical or computer engineer, I guess. And uh, I'm we're asking fundamental limits about these structures, devices, or even concepts of computing and information processing. And then what we do do is we build devices, circuits, and systems. And the common theme is that they're all centered around integrated photonics in one way or another. But that does not mean we, we also use free space photonics and free space octopus as well. So um, as an example, we look at some neural networks, analog processing, um, residue number system arithmetic, even like these um, NP problems. At the fundamental level, we ask ourselves questions like, if, I make, if Intel makes transistors smaller for 50 years and get better performance, is the same true for optoelectronics? So is smaller always better? Now speaking of nanophotonics, right? And if so, to what extent? And there will be traders, of course, as you find. Um, what about attojoule? Is attojoule a fundamental limit? If not, what actually is? For, let's say, link, an optical link, for instance. And can we stop photons? And if we cannot stop photons, what does it mean? Can we do processing maybe while photons need to fly, need to propagate, like in-network processing? Um, and what we then do do is we build some sort of devices, some with very high performance. For instance, here's an, uh, just a few numbers shown. This is, a, let's say, an, uh, an electro-optic modulator that is uh, um, an MZI, mass uh, interferometer, that has a V-pi uh, phase shift um, to get an, so like the voltage, you get a pi phase shift in terms of the length. That basically, basically is a very efficient device here, or some detectors with a very high responsivity, um, all integrated in photonics. And then we build also like photonic neural networks, and recently actually like 4F convolutional neural networks. So I have two parts today. Part one is about the device level, and we look into some very efficient optoelectronic devices mainly. Uh, why we do this is, well, we use a lot of electronics in this world, and many of them, of course, in the optical domain. And uh, this is great, um, but it's growing exponentially with um, you know, 50% or so. So meaning in right now we use 5% of the electricity all for information processing. You, you, like, um, you can do the math in basically eight years, this show is over if you kind of keep scaling like this. So you, the reason why we use so much um, energy is we use about 100,000 photons per, for every bit. Um, and uh, the idea would be, can we just do the good job done with 100 photons? That would be nice. A particular device we're looking into um, is these mo um, electro-optic modulators. Um, and they are basically here, just a, as one example, it's a data center, there's a line card, this is like one of these devices. Of course, they're individually packaged, they're, of course, they're, sm like they're large. So the idea would be, of course, if you do integrated photons, you can make them much, much smaller, and you do this entire scaling that we're doing from the, uh, from the industry that we know from the semiconductor industry. Speaking of, so here's uh, a paper we wrote, and we ask ourselves, this is, again, the device level view. Um, if I have the energy per bit, um, this is actually pico fem to atro. Um, that maps directly to the numbers of photons per bit. Um, in this classical regime right now, in silicon photonics, for instance, we are basically already burning um, tens to hundreds of femtojoules per bit, which means we are, we are burning about 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6 for photons. That's basically how much we um, basically need for device level. At the same time, you can relate the device length via the um, lumped element capacitance, electric capacitance, to a bandwidth that you can modulate the device with. This is basically this axis in meter, micrometer, nanometer, down to a basic modulation speed. And then what you can do, you can multiply the x and the y axis, um, x and y axis together, so you have basically joule per bit times bits per second is basic bits cancels, joule per second is what? It's the physical power burned. And if you, if this is shown in the third dimension, and now we're plotting the ISO power contour line. So this is all these devices here burn one milliwatt. All these devices here burn 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 burn, uh, burn one microwatt. So the idea basically is that we actually want to uh, scale steeper than these ISO power contour lines, because here essentially we are in this regime where, well, if you have a chip now and um, you have one milliwatt per device, you can pretty much put about 10 to the 4 devices on a chip and your laptop would burn or would basically run out of power already. So this is sort of almost from integration density where we basically were in electronics to the 19, shall we say, 70s, 1980s about. So the idea would be now in this regime, we would get to this a microwatt per device, we get le like less energy, even potentially higher speed. That's something to debate. We can debate on the circuit level, of course, understand that. But um, just from the, like again from the device point of view, then we burn a microwatt, which now means we can maybe put 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 devices on the chip. So let's bring the photonics into 1990s plus. Yeah? That's the idea. And uh, nothing comes for free. And there is this Q over V factor here. So that's basically connected to the um, fundamental challenges in optics, which means you need to increase the light band interaction. If you can do this, then you can improve the device functionality. There are two ways to do this. You can increase the interaction time, or you uh, match the wavelength of light with that of matter. Um, 
And the interaction time could, for instance, be a cavity. Of course, you can use high Q factors. The challenge here now is you need to respectfully tune them now. That costs you energy in terms of heaters. And the high, photo, the high Q also limits your photon lifetime. So your remodulation might be limited. Um, on the other hand, if you squeeze the mode, um, you, can device, you can make devices very compact. And it could be potentially very small there for and also very high, um, uh, highly modulated. Uh, the best thing is you do both. Huh? High Q, low volume. And that's basically known as Purcell factor FP, which is a factor that's proportional to Q over V. It's actually a factor that's more known from the QED community, but um, it's something you can borrow and basically analyze like devices as well. Good. So the first topic I thought we discussed is basically like some high nonlinearities. So the idea is you have a material, you add um, control over that material, and then you have some kind of some exploit some new effects with this material. As an example, you can take an ITO, transparent conductive oxide, and you um, explore an ENZ effect. This is epsilon near zero. This is where the permittivity is zero or close to zero. And then if you have this, you can do a whole bunch of things. You can basically have very efficient modulators. With efficient phase shifters, you can now build um, optical phase array. You can um, build analog processors. Actually, I will show you later. Or maybe even some very smart sort of like smart sensing antenna systems. Um, ITO is a material you all know. You probably have it in your hand or in your pocket right now. It's the, it's the, it's the uh, grid of your, um, of your smartphone. There's basically a grid of ITO lines. And when you touch it, basically, you're capacitively loaded. And this is how your phone knows where your finger was. Yeah? So, um, and this, of course, is also now in fancy avionics. It's like this uh, Garmin 5000 touchscreen. Um, you can build transparent uh, displays. And you can, going back to aviation, you can, for instance, imagine you fly at Mach 1 and you have some ice building up. You cannot simply turn a windshield wiper on, right? <laughs> so you need to pass a current through this device, like, 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 like through this layer. So ITO is a real, is a real material that's ha basically has been really processed. Uh, and Intel has recently announced, actually, or has disclosed or interested to put, them, put that material into their, into their fabs now, into their, their systems. So ENZ, what's, what's special at this ENZ point? Well, you all know, you all know this equation. The um, optical refractive index is the square of, like, of the permittivity. So we're interested now in nonlinearities, meaning in a delta n. So the left side, if you do the derivative now of this, well, you see this is, of course, the derivative of this becomes um, epsilon to minus 1 half, which means it's 1 over, right? So now, of course, if the trivial solution would be simply if epsilon becomes 0, this term diverges and delta n diverges. The nonlinearity will become very strong. Case in point, um, pick a third order linearity, let's say, chi 3 is proportional, uh, chi 3 times electric field squared is proportional to, like, to delta um, epsilon. Um, okay, then intensity is proportional to um, E squared. You have your index here. Here's your free space permittivity. You plug that in here. You plug that in there. You get this formula now. So now the nonlinearity is given by this formula. And let's look at this. So there's a very trivial point. Well, <laughs> pump your device hard and you get more nonlinearity. Well, sure, uh, of course. But your material, your material may break down before you can do that. The second one. Uh, and then you have this enhancement factor. And there are basically two options here. There's an intrinsic factor. That's basically uh, your material. So pick a better material we talked about earlier, right, Robert? With like about some nonlinear polymers or so. So pick a different material. Maybe work with a chemist. They can do that. Or maybe dope it or explore that. The other one is now this interesting factor. It's 1 over n squared. And 1 over n squared basically relates to, so 1 over n basically like the rates of the group index, of course. Yeah? So basically, this is the sort of like slow light effect. So essentially, now you could ask, well, sure, but so is does ENZ, is ENZ simply a slow light effect, basically? Or is there something magic about it? Is there something different? And the answer is yes and no. So uh, number one, it is a slow light effect. So that's like any other slow light effect. But let's say if you have like an EIT system, an EIT system, if you go to slow light, um, the um, energy of this, 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 this slow light, like the energy has to go somewhere. Where does it go? In the EIT system, often basically it goes from uh, the energy goes into the electron being very um, tightly connected to the, um, to the core. And it basically, energy goes into that spring constant. Huh? You simply basically tighten or change that spring constant. In ITO, it's a free carrier driven system. So you cannot basically uh, put in the spring constant. So where does it go? It has to go into the electric field, of course. That's the answer. Huh? Which means now from an engineering point of view, so what does it mean from an engineering point of view? Well, you can now put, um, basically have ENZ or, 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 or slow light effects without dispersion engineering your mode. Meaning you, if you have mentioned like a very small sub wavelength structure, you can get an ENZ enhancement of this small structure without propagating the mode. So this could be an interesting effect. Now, how can we uh, get such materials? So basically, here is um, indium tin oxide. 
Um, it's a material that's a bit tricky to, to, to operate with. It is uh, indium oxide doped with tin, so you have different, you have like a resistive well. What we did here in this case, we actually changed the sputtering oxygen concentration and annealed it and not annealed it. And you notice you can get quite a bit of different uh, parameters. I mean, this is like, like an optical image and it looks different and guess what, it is different, of course. So we wanted to have a really good control over this and we spent actually quite a bit of time in NIST's clean room to do this entire metrology. It's a profilometer of four probe elapsometry hall bar and you notice you have all these interdependencies. You can get the thickness yeah, or resistivity in multiple ways. And what we did is only if all four gave us a consistent data point, we took it into the study. Then we repeated the study five times to look for consistency and then published this paper, basically. So the, and what we basically found is that indeed we can actually, by changing the oxygen concentration, we can indeed actually have the position where this, the real part um, of the permittivity can indeed be zero. Yeah? So now we can actually, with an, with an oxygen concentration, tune this point spectrally um, where, where basically where this point occurs. And of course, then other parameters like carrier concentration, et cetera, like basically behave like similarly. So um, of course you get now a strong linearity with this um, or a strong index change. So uh, index uh, permittivity, um, real imaginary part. And um, here's of course now for this, is, is there two data points for an actual device we built. Um, this is as processed. This is when you now apply a capacitance and you change the carrier concentration. This is simply, it's simply like a MOS capacitor. A uh, device actually is shown here. So you have these um, uh, ITO oxide metal and you apply a voltage, carry start to move, you form accumulation layer. This changes now the carry concentration, which is these different curves here. And you can now simply move at this particular wavelength, which is 1310 nanometer, this dashed line. You can now bring it close to ENZ basically point. Yeah? So you can actually modulate it to ENZ. Of course, if you have a strong delta N, Kramer's conic tells you, you get a small, you get a strong delta kappa. Right, of course, loss kicks in. That's basically what you see here. In this device, that's what we actually do, we do use. So this is actually an electroabsorption modulator. This has a performance of 1 dB per micron. About insertion loss is also relatively high. You see this, this ratio is not particularly great, but it was a first try back in the day. And you like, just need a few volts. So recently then, this is like, um, more recent work, we, came, uh, we used actually this, this delta N effect now in, in modulators. So these are all phase shifters or MZI based modulators. This is photonic one, this is ITO against silicon. This one is ITO against, um, against another uh, uh, contact here. And this mode is a plasmonic mode. This is basically metal on, on, over ITO on silicon again on this arm, and this is a pure plasmonic mode, basically where we directly like, like um, change the mode itself. And if you now look at this V pi L, this is the voltage, you get a pi phase shift times the length, lower is better, yeah? lower voltage, lower length is better. You basically notice that these are these three data points from these devices, it actually starts to look quite competitive actually, compared to you know, all the other options we have. Um, the latest one actually is like 11 volt micrometer. So this is, uh, this is still in progress, these two are already underway, or, or published. Um, by the way, if you're in a quantum, quantum, I'm not a quantum guy, but of course, <laughs> in general, so if you're in quantum optics or, or, or quantum photonics, um, imagine you have um, a Josephson junction system operating at four Kelvin, and you have like these millivolt switches and, and millivolt signals from the Josephson junction, and you want to use light now to bring this, basically this light now out into free space or into, uh, into the 300 um, Kelvin bath. Um, well, uh, it is actually pretty dangerous to actually, so what you, you can use, an, uh, you, you should certainly not use an electroabsorption device because the energy is simply dissipated here yeah, in your, in your four Kelvin bath. If you use an MZI, well, of course, if one would think there is no loss, but of course, the, in, 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 uh, in, the, in the light off state, this um, uh, deconstructively interfering mode basically scatters into your bath and actually heats up your bath all, as well. So that's something that's not good. So the idea what we had here for this particular direction, this was actually the IR per um, super cables program, is to actually simply use a phase shifter in the four Kelvin bath and then do the interference right here in the 300 Kelvin bath where you have a much higher um, sort of like or much higher window of performance. Yeah? It's probably, that was probably the only way to get at least to the, to the, to the, to the goals of this, um, of this grant, at least from our side. Um, so uh, speaking of Kramer's chronic, we actually um, uh, explored Kramer's chronic synergistically to, better build, like to, be, to build a better electroabsorption modulator. And a classical one, you send light in and you basically modulate it and you want to basically absorb light. Now, what could we do better than this? In other words, when we, we have, when we, when we turn this on, we have a strong delta N, right? So here we want to use delta copper, but delta N here can be used now by simply adding an island and basically building a directional coupler. In other words, instead of also absorbing the light, we simply route the light away, and then this 
throughput port sees lower light than in this case. Yeah? So simply in, like coupling assisted system. And then in the other one, um, this is in the light off state and light on state. Now here, there is, there, like delta N is basically zero. So there's no coupling. So this is basically turned off. And now ITO is basically in the dielectric state, which means it doesn't absorb at all. It's basically simple, like regular dielectric and high index. Yeah? So the throughput, and this is a full like photonic, not plasmonic um, device. And with this, actually, we, strate we strategically use Kramer's chronic, which is very nice and interesting. Um, in this case, um, here's the, the transfer function versus voltage. Um, we see an extinction ratio of 7, uh, 0.75 dB for every, for every volt we apply. And the insertion loss, this is a pure photonic device, of, and this is just 4 micrometers short. It's just 0.5 dB. It's almost nothing. Um, or relatively low, at least. And it's spectrally broadband, because there's no resonator or no other um, cavity used in here. This is an interesting uh, like other direction. Now, having uh, these ITO phase shifters, we can also, of course, build um, optical phase arrays and um, beam steering system. And the idea here is, unlike in, let's say, thermally tuned system, which are kind of slow, like thermally tuned, like millisecond, right? Here, we're looking for uh, basic devices now or systems, uh, beam steers that would, they would basically switch in the order of gigahertz. And gigahertz, of course, from a path length distance corresponds to maybe a few meters of, of signaling, um, which is probably something that robotics might be very interested in. Yeah? In cars, you're already basically in the hundreds of meters, so this is like microsec like basically microseconds is fast enough. But if you really want to do this like, like this in interior robotics, then this is probably like the range you're looking at. So with this uh, platform, basically, we showed already like 80 dB of, beam, uh, basically of beam steering and um, it's because we can like very fast at least gigahertz like modulate these uh, like these um, phase shifters uh, in uh, Star Wars hands up. Yes, Star Wars. Thank you in a galaxy far far away. There are laser guns sure yeah, but um, well if they're laser guns we need to protect ourselves right so on the defense side but, but did you know basically that these laser guns already exist on the planet right now you can google this this is the uh, Helios system from Lockheed Martin you can actually shoot down things from barges so it's actually a real system and it's, com it's supposed to come if you look at the time here by 2022 2020 2020 and 2021 and these system this is uh, this systems are really coming so in other words we need to develop defensive capabilities now for these and this is of course what goes into this uh, field of optical limiters um, so we, we want basically the question is how can we engineer a material that instantaneously adjusts its optical reflection to uh, deflect and let's say laser fire for instance so the idea is well we can use of course not only optics but as a problem as a weak response and the answer of course is let's use ENZ for this so um, you can basically look now and change essentially again at this ENZ point. The reflection coefficient increases. You can basically you now engineer the system that um, we have a, a very strong reflection. And with this uh, initial result here from our ENZ um, ITO samples, we basically see already like a 10 dB change of the signal. Um, so and the good thing about this is it's it's I mean I put broadband here. It's broadband I guess is relative. So this works over like 20 to 30 nanometer range, which so it's not a cavity, right? So it's not extremely uh, uh, narrow, but it's also not ultra broadband. And pump probe um, basically uh, experiments showed basically uh, like sub sub uh, picosecond time scales. So we're very happy with these results. We're actually doing some Z scan measurements further to um, to look into this in more detail. There's actually some sort of like a factor even of 20 dB that we found. Um, it look, looks like some sort of five photon scattering event, but that's something we still need to understand a little bit more. Uh, but the idea would be, yeah, you have your sensitive systems, and you basically integrate this material maybe around the sensitive sensors here that you like to shield from. Nanophotonic emitters, um, one big summary slide of a whole bunch of lasers we did, some plasmon lasers, some tunable plasmon lasers. With IBM, then, we actually look at these uh, uh, three, five heterogeneously integrated on silicon lasers, plasmon lasers, that is like a little tiny island here. Um, and we turned, we looked actually, or we found that um, we can, by putting the metal on top versus leaving the metal out, we can reduce the operating temperature at threshold by about 30 degrees. This is good for like CMOS or like, like thermal budgets. We can also found that by making this island pretty small, these nano lasers, I mean, nano in a true word of nano, like uh, hundreds of nanometers, you actually have, can end up with like zero defects. So this is 3.5, when you, when, you, when, you, when you edge 3.5, you get basically defects on your walls, right? Um, surface velocity re uh, recombination you can get, end up with a situation where you have zero defects, basically, here. Um, we also looked into some, like, with, like, with a like NASA SBR project, with a company together here, into some sort of, like, beam steering system using, like, phase arrays um, um, on our, uh, basic, on, like, Vixel technology using our ITO, um, like, like, systems. Uh, something else we looked at recently is, um, we look at tunnel junctions. So imagine you have two Fermi levels. You have one bias one against the other. Electron tunnels over, becomes a hot electron, and it can relax down now in two ways, elastically, heat, 
not interested, or inelastically a photon. There was a paper from the 1970s that basically predicted this, this can be up to 10% as efficiency if you do it stimulated. So, um, well, so here was our first attempt to, to, to uh, build such a device. Um, so this is an, basically a metal oxide semiconductor-like device, I and mean, we have a small tunnel junction. And um, you can drive it now, and let's see whether this video here works. Uh, this is, so this is uh, simply pulsed slow enough so the camera can capture it. This is an electrically driven uh, room temperature photon source. This device in the end worked, but it was kind of bad design because the metal was sitting on top um, and the light wouldn't scatter out. So we have to etch actually gratings into this uh, metal to actually capture the light out. The question is, can we do better? So now the good thing is we know now that um, the tunneling electron is responsible for the photon emission. So if I can now quantize my tunneling electron, coulomb plocate effect, yeah, then I can, single electron transistor-like story, can I then basically get, with a certain probability, a photon? And um, the idea is, well, probably I can do this, but um, typically this device would not work at room temperature. Then we turn to graphene plasmons. So if you have a graphene tunnel junction, the graphene plasmon, they have a very strong dispersion. At one EV, at one volt bias, they have basically the physical length of these photons, or the physical wavelength is on the order of like 14 nanometer. Which now means if you make a tiny 14 nanometer cross junction, yeah, capacitor, it turns out the Coulomb blockade um, uh, the charging requirement of this little island, you can work actually the temperature out such that indeed you should be able to do it at, like at room temperature. So this would be now a single photon, electrically driven, um, single uh, room temperature like device. Um, I don't have the data yet. Um, we found some negative resistance, so we think the tunneling system, basically like the tunnel junction is working already, but um, I don't can show you not the device itself, but this is again a work in progress. Uh, 2D material optoelectronics. Um, we believe 2D materials are interesting materials from various points. So, um, uh, for instance, we have these tiny modes. This is a cross section of an optical waveguide, a plasmonic mode, which is high, high field density. Um, uh, it, these modes are good because, for instance, from electro optic modulators, performance point of view, uh, the energy per bit scales with voltage over Q squared. If we just like look at the volt, uh, like voltage, um, this is the mode volume. Uh, low mode volume of your mode basically improves the energy per bit. So that means um, squeezing the mode, actually the, f the physical size of your modular actually improves energy per bit, which means if you have these tiny modes now, they are very synergistic to, so these, these, these small materials are very synergistic to, to these like plasmonic structures now. They also have exciting new um, uh, uh, for, like physics basic, they have these excitonics, so the, exit, the binding energy is 0.5 EV, so it's stable at room temperature. Um, you can get basically very strong index changes. They're electro-optic tunable, they're position controllable, they're patternable with lithography, and they're compatible with any substrate. It's basically a quantum well you can really put almost anywhere. Yeah? No lattice match needed, like, unlike 3.5. The challenge, however, is that you need to transfer them basically in a cross-contamination free way. And the way we typically do this is we, 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 we have these um, PDMS and then these glass cover slides. And you can, this is all transparent, so you can see through. You pick a particular one, and let's say this is like a ring resonator, you can place exactly one over here. The problem is you have all these other flakes also on this, on this, like on this, on this sheet, and you transfer them pretty much all over the place. And if you're an integrated photonics like myself, this is not a solution. Yeah? This is not good. So what we basically did, we developed like this 2D material like printer, where we have this suspended PDMS with these 2D materials, and we use a micro stamper, and we just selectively transfer this one over here. And uh, seeing is believing. So, where's the mouse? So here's a little video a student took. Um, so here are the 2D materials. Let's zoom down to the chip first. So here's our chip. Here's a silicone waveguide. Here's a prefabricated contact. Right here, I would like to have a 2D material, and only there, nowhere else. Let's zoom back to the 2D materials. OK, so there are typically many of them on the chip. There are these triangle shape. Let's say we want to transfer only this one and not nothing else. So now what we do, we bring our uh, micro stamper over this. We align it. And we can change the zoom. You align it now down basically to your, um, to your substrate. And alignment, of course, can be down these days, closed loop, 10 nanometers, 10, 15 nanometers, no problem. Now you press it down, you release it. And the best thing about this whole process, basically, it just takes uh, 50 seconds. So now we can actually build heterostructures within minutes. Yeah? You can really build multi multiple structures. We do machine learning now on the 2D material thicknesses. So we basically can determine, we can tell the tool now, um, pick uh, a particular material um, that's, that's bilayer, trilayer, and place it exactly there. Now we can build heterostructures. And this is something we're doing now in this like, recent awarded um, Durup grant. Um, 2D materials can be used. We can build uh, modulators with this. This is in push-pull dual graphene modulators. This is basically graphene's polyblocking. 
um, that has been demonstrated before, and we are optimizing this design. We added a DBR on top that basically lets the light reflect up and down, so we increase the path length. And with this, basically, we found, um, this is currently, I think, to my knowledge, the fastest um, graphene modulator to date. It's a 60 gigahertz roll-off, open eye at 54 gigahertz per second. You see the extinction ratio is about 18 dB, insertion loss 2 dB. It's actually a pretty decent device. Um, we built, and now the challenge with graphene is graphene is very thin, and the, if you have a silicon photonic mode, the interaction is very weak. So we said, can we increase this? And the idea was we packaged this um, uh, silicon, uh, this IT owner on top of um, uh, like a silicon structure, like, a sil like, like an SOR waveguide, and then actually have a very tiny metallic slot. And this very tiny metallic slot focuses, of course, the light right here, and it's basically in plane with the graphene, so the like, field polarization is nice. And what this helped us actually, it helped us um, to distinguish the um, photocurrent here in red versus bias voltage from the dark current here, shown here uh, in black. So this is basically work from, uh, from the IBM group before, which basically shows you can only have the highest photocurrent exactly when you minimize basically like your carriers. This is basically like a fight between the, be it the photovoltaic mode and the bolometric mode or the bolometric photocurrent of, um, of graphene. So you only have this one point of operation yeah, where you basically like minimize the carrier density. But you would like to ideally operate at higher biases. So here actually now we, uh, and, in this, and this is basically like a long channel device. In our device, it's basically a short channel device, short channel in a transistor-like point of view. We have a truly like an, uh, you actually in this ballistic transport basically in this channel. And because uh, this channel is on the order of, uh, we made it down to 15 nanometer, 1.5, um, these source and drain contacts here. And with this now, we were able to actually suppress the forward um, a dark current and therefore increase actually the on-off ratio by a factor of 60 from the photocurrent to the dark current um, uh, in this device. So um, just more to this, um, this, this uh, open data or the, like this square data here is, uh, are essentially for a uh, 15 nanometer um, uh, tiny uh, 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 slot. These ones are for 30 nanometer, which is actually interesting. This is the photocurrent, which basically shows if I actually decrease my, f my gap width by half, I have half the, foot, the area to absorb light, yet I get double the photocurrent, actually. So it basically shows that, indeed, the light matter interaction of the small slot actually helps. Um, if you compare this device from a performance, basically we show um, we have a responsivity of 0.7 amps per watt, which I think is Pretty one of maybe the highest or even one of the highest to date measured in graphene. The dark current is eight microamps, um, and the most important parameter is probably like this gain band of product, which we haven't exactly measured in this particular device yet, um, but it scales inverse proportionally with the gap square. So we're expecting um, basically this to be extremely high in the order of like, like 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4. Um, uh, recently, we moved and moved forward and did um, 2D material integrated. Like this is now MOT2. This is now an, like a uh, TMDC material, like a transition metal dichalcogenide, um, on the ring resonator. Um, this is a photo detector as well. It has now it has a band gap, and because it has a band gap now, of course your dark current is significantly lower, about a thousand times lower than compared to graphene. Now it's like just like 10 nanoamps or lower. Um, the responsivity is 0.5 amps per watt. It's pretty good. But there was something interesting about this device. MOT2 is band gap is 1.04 EV, at, um, which means at, this is at 1550 nanometer, which is at 0.8 EV, which means we should, we should not have any absorption. So how can we have absorption here? And the, and the idea was actually we used strain engineering. We actually wrapped this um, MOT2 around this waveguide to do, have tensile strain at these corners here. And this tensile strain, unlike a flat device, actually um, changes the band gap from 1 EV down to, down to 0.8 EV. So now this material starts absorbing, and we have data for these both devices, and indeed show this doesn't absorb, this, this does absorb. Yeah? Um, so it's actually an, um, uh, like a strain engineered for the detector device. Um, uh, and then and, uh, we move forward and actually now build the first axitonic for the detector. So here we have actually 2D material uh, overlapping exactly with, um, with this uh, plasmonic slot mode, which is that's over here. This is the overlap factor. So if we decrease the slot width, we have more, um, more basic overlap, so more absorption. Now we built this device here. This is a tiny slot. Notice it's a, the slot is almost grainy a little bit. And this has to do that we deposit this metal actually with an evaporator. And you get like, these tiny poly crystalline flakes on the order of like 10 nanometer. And this is why this, why this slot at this scale is actually a little bit wavy. Huh? This is the photonic slot. Um, so that's something that's, of course, expected. And if you look at the performance, actually, now this actually gives a very strong um, responsivity of almost 1.4 amps per watt. So, of course, we have some 
looks like we actually have some gain, no surprise, because the photon lifetime, uh, the carrier lifetime is uh, much longer than the transit time to get to, the, like, to these contacts left and right, because it's just like, 11, uh, like, like a nanometer short, right? So we have actually some gain, and um, this is, um, um, and right now we're doing like, speed testing on this device. Okay, switching gears to part two. Um, so now let's talk about circuits and systems um, and photonic analog processors. So at a very high level, why should we even consider photonics for information processing? Um, well, um, Moore's law is basically dead, pretty much, as such. Um, uh, then there are very hard problems in, that we need to solve, like these uh, non-polynomial uh, time-complete problems. Um, and we probably like to do more processing at the edge of uh, the system, and as opposed to going all the way back to the data centers and sending like, the information back. So now there are various um, strengths and pain points by doing it in photonics. The main idea is basically you would set your, let me call them weights, you would, you would preset your processor or your photonic structure, let's say photonic circuit, and all you need to do then is simply pipeline your data through this photonic structure and read out the answer from the end. So if you do this, essentially, it becomes a non-iterative for order of one processor. So it's non-iterative, like not, like not basically um, sequential. If you, do it, if you work in integrated photonics, this delay basically on, our, on the order of nanosecond, which means you have a near real-time processor. Um, you can, of course, the old things that are kind of like known already, um, uh, bosonification, I call it, basically parallelism, like a WDM. There's a natural Fourier transform, um, lens does like a natural Fourier transform, so convolutions are not free, but cheap. The wire basically has low loss, fundamentally, compared to electronics. See, in electronics, you're charging up a wire cost energy, yeah? There's a capacitance, we don't have it here. Um, and fabrication processes are pretty nice now. There's some real pain points, there's no real memory. Um, um, but you can use phase change materials to get non-volatility into your system. The footprint is on the device part relatively high. The EU conversion costs you and packaging is an issue overall. So all things to consider. Um, and the trend, however, we see is the following. So a GPU is actually much faster than a CPU. So CPU is a generalized processor. A GPU is a graphics card which does a particular type of processing very well, um, but it's not a generalist anymore. This paper is now from Google. This is now a TPU. This is a tra like, a, like a tensor process unit. It's actually much better for to do at least particular processing. This is like, ve like vector matrix multiplication, much better than a GPU. So, um, and how much better is it actually? If you look at these numbers, here's 15 to 30 times and 30 to 80 times uh, uh, like lower power and, 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 and speed. If you multiply these two, you see basically a TPU is about a factor of almost 10 to the 3 better than like, than like a GPU. I would say no surprise because um, this is now a very, like, very specialized processor. So the trend t seems to go towards heterogeneity and towards like, specialized processors. So now we should, I'm asking, well, if there's a GPU, a CPU, a GPU, a TPU, how about a PPU, photonic process unit? Why not? There's nothing that's fundamentally against this. If you have a particular process you'd like to speed up, this could be, would be now what's called an accelerator or a coprocessor. So I think that's a fair, fair thing to do. So um, we looked into something called RNS and, and resident number system analog processor. So the, the way we came about is to ask, can we stop a photon? And well, a photon has momentum, of course, yeah, certainly. And we can certainly slow a photon down, of course, slow light effect, cavity, etc. But if you just stay classically for a moment, this is not exactly true, but if you just stay classically uh, for, for a second, if, well, if V would go to zero, the velocity, then M had to go to infinity because P is larger than zero, right? So that cannot be the case. So that means the photon would create another big bang. That's uh, not physical. So meaning we can actually never really stop a photon without annihilating it. So it must always propagate. So can we get any processing done while processing, while flowing photons in a, like in a network? Yeah, by simply routing photons, you get actually processing done, yeah? information process, let's say additions. So here's this, um, this concept, it's called residue number system arithmetic. Basically what this arithmetic says is you can express a number, an integer, based on its prime number factorization and then the residue based on that prime number factorization. Example, let's say down here we um, have uh, number six. Um, number six would be, let's say, the answer out of, out of an um, addition of two plus four. Um, and the answer is now, well, answer is obviously six. So if you have, let's say, this optical processor now, this is in a five by five um, router, five waveguides in, uh, you basically have a signal coming at a two. These are all two by two switches. And the answer of this, of course, is six divided by, um, like, modulus five is one rest one, residue one. The residue one basically means it comes out, comes out of this particular port. 
so the mapping from this algorithm to hardware, to photonic hardware is the, this digitwise shifting, this addition that you need in this, um, uh, in, this, uh, in this arithmetic, basically you can simply do by two by two switches. You stay in a bar port, let's say it's zero, you go to a cross port, it's basically a plus one. The next one, the modulus, yeah, what you divide it by, your prime number, is simply given by the numbers of waveguides you have. And then the residue is the specific output port at which you read the, like the signal from. This is called in, in computer engineering one, one hot encoding. Yeah? So we can build a system, and here we actually analyzed um, how um, this system would perform from a computation and from a communication point of view. And we compared this against the electronic network on chip using FETs or 22 nanometer technology node, and then basically like this RNS processor. And what we basically find is that, no surprise, in computation we are not better than electronics. No surprise, because electronics is very good on computing. Yeah? Switching basically is something that electronics can do very, very good. But in the communication part, meaning the crossbar and the four-port router, actually we win in terms of um, energy and delay. Um, and we can actually pick up a pretty decent um, actually improvement factor. Another project we're looking into um, is an analog photonic PDE solver. So partial differential equations are really ubiquitous, of course, in engineering and in science and physics. They are basically everywhere. Um, and when we solve them, um, well, it takes oftentimes like a very long time. Um, because essentially it's a really like a brute force system. Yeah? Like when you have COMSOL, I mean, you yeah, see nodding heads here, right? Lumerical, COMSOL, all So it really takes a long time because you go one by one, you know, Maxwell's equation, all the, all the like, degrees of freedom at every point. Um, so you kind of like this person up here, but you want to eat your computer basically. So the answer can, or question is, can analog computing help? So the idea is the following. Let's say we have like a uh, particular problem. Let's say just like a heat transfer problem. Um, you have a space, you have a hot side, a cold, cold, another cold side. And you would like to get this sort of this, like this distribution. The first thing that typically your program is doing is FEM, finite element method. Basically, you discretize it. Yeah? You cut it into small pieces. We could have now a processor, basically, that has essentially a grid. So it maps all these, all these grid points yeah, onto this processor, onto this like, like hardware. And what you now do is, how do you program it? Well, you simply set the boundary condition. You say, it's hot here, it's cold here, and here, and here. And let the center ones basically reconfigure themselves after you flow a current, let's say an electrical current, light, or maybe a displacement current, through the structure. Because why? All these nodes coupled, they're all like a lumped element now. Yeah? They all feel each other. They are, they're sensitive to the phases of each other. And then you read them out. And the good thing about this is you can program and read out them all simultaneously in time. Yeah? There's, a one, there's a one stop, like a, like a one step to program, and then one to read out, and there's no sort of iterative reconfiguration in between. So what's a computer basically fundamentally? Well, a computer basically is a black box that has an input and output. And depending on the memory, um, whether how much memory it has, it's either simply a function, or I call it a filter, uh, a finite state automaton, a pushed-on automaton, or in a true sense where you can access any state in the memory, it's a, it's, a, it's a true Turing machine. I'm arguing let's not do a true Turing machine in optics. I think this was an, something we tried in the 80s and it's not a good idea. So let's build um, more specialized computers that basically do not need to access memory often because that costs you, basically. So here's an idea for the system again. Here's the idea. Um, uh, it, these typically iterative like, pro, like methods like FTDD or so are basically very iterative. It's not a good approach. So here's the idea actually from the 1950s. This is Lieberman and co. And the idea is you have actually a grid of resistors. Uh, this is electronics now. I see uh -huh, some people looked up the papers. <laughs> um, so what you can do now here is you have this grid of, let's say, resistors. And again, what you do is you, you, you say it's, you program this boundary condition, this boundary condition, and you basically, uh, Kirchhoff's law says current splits equally every direction, but this whole active, this whole circuit is a lumped element circuit. It feels all nodes, the phases all basically adjust, and you read all like parameters out almost instantaneously. Yeah? Um, and what's interesting about this is if you actually have a, a grid of resistors, you can solve any type of Laplace equation. If you add a current source, you can solve any type of Poisson equation. RC, dif uh, diffusion, LC, uh, wave equation. It's a very powerful, uh, basic method. So um, again, mathematically, it's a great idea. Um, you have a mesh. You can make this mesh ultra fine in math. You can make it as small as you want. Uh, there's no limit to anything. Um, but then the computation power, you were limited by the computation power. If you make this electronically now, like in the 1950s, they aimed for this, you can make the mesh maybe at least fine, not ultra fine, but fine. But now you li have limitations in terms of charging. The, the old RC delay, or interconnect delay, we know from processors, from all this, you know, the, the fringe capacitance, you have those again in the system. So it doesn't help you. 
Now, chemicals in optics, let's say in photonics, let's say, uh, in flowing photons, like through a silicon photonic structure, let's say, like this. We can do this. Um, the resolution is probably coarse only now, not fine anymore, because this is now hundreds of micrometer. But there's a real issue, actually. The issue is, um, the issue is that, uh, uh, well, like, let, me, let me get to the issue in a moment. The pros are actually, well, I can scale the system up. It, um, photons take just like tens of picoseconds to flow through the structure. You can read out this very, very quickly. So here we built a system now, a 5x5 five five silicon photonic, um, you know, reconfigurable optical computer prototype, basically. So here's a photonic 5x5 um, five five structure. And the building block is sort of, uh, at least like clover leaf like structures where light is equally split from each direction where we send it into. And we, let's say here's this problem where we send light only in here. So this is like the hot port, and all these ports are basically cold. Yeah? So the answer we are seeking is something like this. And these, here's the answer we're getting. This is an optical image from a camera reading all these basic points out simultaneously in time. And this is now overlaid these actual data points yeah, from the actual measurements of color coded. And um, now you can ask, well, how good is it? Um, and if you compare this now to an, so our ground truth now is a COMSOL 5x5 engine of this. So we simulate this whole structure using COMSOL and you basically have a certain solution. And then basically you can be compared this against this measured results and we found it's about, the error is about two to three percent. Yeah, Accuracy is about 97 percent. Now, if you're a really computer engineer, you say, this is not good, this is bad, this is not really accurate enough, this is not, you know, your 16 or 32-bit resolution. Uh, true, because the error is a few percent, right? But um, it may be good enough for some, for some projects or for some uh, uh, directions, and, uh, or you can use it as an initializer on your, um, f of your PDE system. The speeds now, now how fast can a system be? Well, um, how fast can I assign these laser ports? Well, I can switch them electro-optically, which means that that should be like less than a nanosecond. Uh, the read now is, is depends on the time of flight of the photon plus my detection time, which is probably all of, all of like just like a fraction of a nanosecond. And again, I have to simultaneously read and write basically on this. The problem again, why we have this inaccuracy is because the um, size of the circle is now much larger than the, like in the wavelength. So I'm not in a lumped element anymore which means my face is changing across the system. So now can we do better? And the idea is this is an idea from Nader essentially, that we, that we essentially um, uh, like went with. Uh, well, of course, if I have my, make my material simply very, very tiny, A is this material size is much smaller than the wavelength. Now, of course, my, I can simply, by controlling the permittivity, I can simply get the, uh, essentially an, an equivalent circuit function of this. Yeah? Let's say real part is larger than zero gives me like basic capacitor, for instance. So now what we're doing, we're doing the same thing like Lieberman did in electronics, but with basically now with this, meta, with this metatronic system. And we're flowing not a current, not, not optical power, but we're, play, but, but, but we're flowing uh, this displacement current through the structure. And now the first thing we need to do for, we need to create a wire, yeah? like these basic, let's say these wires here. And how we can we create this wire? This wire basic is where this displacement current is not zero, or meaning left and right of it, it needs to be zero, which means we force it to be zero by making permittivity zero or make it ENZ. Yeah? Um, now we have a circuit board for this uh, processor, and now we can basically put reconfigurable elements inside that we can actually program. These are basically like these red ones. And these can be, of course, our ITO we showed before by basically capacitively gating them and basically putting them into capacitor or basically even negative into basic an inductor as I showed before. So now we can build this. So here's the, the expected solution. Here's this uh, structure now. And this is basically like a simulation now of this ITO structure in, ideals, in an ideal world. So it maps very well. You get actually the real, like the real solution for this. There's a small discrepancy because in the end, actually, JD is not exactly zero because they have losses, right? So like the complex part of, uh, of ITO is part there. Um, good. So, and we are actually right now working on an, um, on an so we, we, we built a structure. We measure it right now in, in, um, with, with Andrea Alu. Um, next uh, up in New York. Um, good. Um, neuromorphic processes. So like neuromorphic engines basically are um, in machine learning is on the rise. You can use, you can use it for deep learning, um, image classification, language processing. You can do nonlinear optimization problems like predictive control, like things for the military, for instance, like target recognition, target tracking. Um, or you can do general adversary networks, which can do transformation. You can use this one before decoying, camouflaging, a lot of things. Um, the question is, why is electronics not good enough, and should we investigate photonic uh, neuromorphic systems? And my answer to this is, if you're interacting, let's say, with a phone, if you ask, hey, Siri, you know, uh, where is the next gas station? Oh, actually, there we go. <laughs> um, uh, okay, actually, it's told me something. But you see, my, my, my brain actually... Thank you so much. Uh, I never tried this, actually. <laughs> um, so 
my brain has a response time of, of basically like, like, a, like a millisecond, which means electronics is way, uh, this is fast enough, right? I, I wasn't waiting, I wasn't stalling here and waiting, come on Siri, let's speed up, right? So in, um, the point is if your application wants the answer in a nanosecond or very, very short time frame, then photonics is probably your solution. So let's look as a community for those applications basically that really require such, an, um, or such a demand. You know? And this is basically one of them, for instance. Okay, so neural networks, of course, they have hidden layers, uh, input and output. It's an, uh, a nonlinear hypothesis uh, system that can learn and classify. So it's basically a good pattern recognizer. Um, this is the work we're doing now with Paul Prosnan from Princeton. This is the uh, E2CDA and uh, like SRC Encore. The idea basically is um, you've probably heard about a Prosoptron model. Prosoptron has uh, three functions. Basically, it has the uh, and dot product multiplication, weights, synaptic weights, summation, and then a nonlinear threshold. And uh, the way we map this on the photonics, basically, this is now, in, again, in, like a silicon photonic circuit system here, is we have photonic tu like tunable uh, 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 weight bank filters, which are basically um, color sensitive. The summation is very simple. It's, it's the simplest thing in photonics. It's basically a photo detector. It just integrates everything irrespective of phase. And then lastly, uh, you need now your signals in the electronic domain. You can send this as a gate now onto your electro-optic modulator um, to actually modulate a new signal. And what you do now is from an architecture, this is like one node now, one of these bubbles. Yeah? You now multiplex them all on one common bus ring. So this is like a broadcast and weight protocol. So you have essentially, so this is essentially what I just showed you. It's like basically one of these nodes. Many of these nodes now all, are all with different colors. I'd say this is like the, the, the yellow one, this is the pink one, there's a blue one and red one in between. They all uh, multiplex on this ring, which now means they all talk to each other in one layer. And architecturally, uh, you can see this like this. So it's essentially as if you have each of these now is one of these uh, neurons, and they're all c commonly multiplexed on this common bus ring. Or this is basically exactly like what a recurrent neural network is. Yeah? All of them talk to, like, it's an, it's an all to all connectivity. Um, if you want to build now a feed-forward neural network, you take this and you cascade this next to each other multiple times with little basically tunable filters in between that, that control the, like the weights in between. So we built this now with, um, uh, and looked into this using our ITO modulators. Um, we built a two-layer neural network um, um, uh, uh, executing MNIST. MNIST is like a very, from computer engineering, not a very fancy algorithm, but it's a very cute toy problem. But we have like um, handwritten sets of, um, of digital, of like black and white data. And we actually have this, uh, this neural network um, process this data and give us an, an, like an accuracy of rec recognizing the correct digit, like basically like, you know, one to nine plus zero. Um, the total power is like five milliwatt. And basically that means we have about 12 picojoule per bit. Uh, based on these devices. And the key point, I guess, from, like, from our point of view is we actually introduced this nonlinear activation function of uh, being the electro-optic modulator's um, like transfer function. Um, the computer engineers actually really love a particular transfer function. That's called a ReLU, a rectifying linear unit. It's basically simply um, a step, it's basically in, in, it's piecewise linear. It's basically flat and then basically has, an, has a linear slope. Reality, because we, like you do back propagation and gradient descent algorithms, when you train these, you actually need to cannot have a, a very sharp kink here because it's not differenti differentiable here. So what you actually have, you, have a, like you use a soft reload. So you use a function that basically looks like this. And we wanted to engineer this basically in optoelectronics. And the answer for us was we use actually ITO's Pauli blocking transfer function and combined this with the free carriers from ITO to basically get this sort of function like this. So here's the data points for this. And indeed, it actually works as an, uh, as an uh, basically as a reload. Um, good. Um, in terms of computing at a high level, um, uh, typical computers, uh, von Neumann systems, are centralized, rely on switching and um, execute a stored program. These non von Neumann systems now inherently decentralized, which means they rely on communication, which means uh, they're uh, they're very good for photonics and optics. Um, so the interconnection function, of course, is again multiply and accumulate, which means this mag per joule, mag per second, is the key factor. So, and, I'm, and I introduced this to you because I want to show you this, this overall um, slide here. This is the efficiency mag per, per joule versus the computational speed. And all the electronic processes all live in this little box down here. So neuromorphic electronics now has shown it can break beyond this fundamental digital, like digital efficiency wall. And um, now we are pushing basically to the right in terms of speed and energy. And you can ask fundamentally actually what is this energy per mag given by? And it's actually given by a few factors. So it's um, number one, um, the, given by the um, entire quantum efficiencies of your laser, your waveguide, and all these points. This is the fan in or fan out. Um, let's say in a fully neural network, this is actually exactly one. Um, this is uh, just some prefactors. Now you can ask how many 
charges, how many uh, basically physical charges do you have on your electro-optic modulator to do the, to the um, nonlinear activation function. And the goal of this program here was actually to hit 10 to the 18 max per joule. That's this star up there. Um, and you can solve this now, and you can actually find uh, 10 attocoulombs or 60 electrons. So you need to get the job done with 60 electrons. Now, how good is silicon photonics? Right here, 10 to the 6 charges. That's why it's sort of down here. Yeah? It, it's good, but it's not very good yet. These are our devices right now. We are not all the way up. We are about 10x away from this goal, but we have, we are, it's, things look promising at least. Um, we can also use this. Everything I told you so far right now, it simply works with um, analog tuning of filters. We also look into, into spiking neural networks, um, for instance, like a leaky integrated fire um, algorithm. And this can be used actually to do mirror symmetry detection. So imagine I would ask you, what is the symmetry of this image? We would say, oh, of course, the center point is, and then, oh, okay, but you can fold it like this, and you can fold it like this, and you can fold it diagonally. And um, so that's would be the answer, right? It's like the symmetry. So you can actually do this with a neural network that has spikes. So you can basically say, imagine I have a two-layer neural network, an upper layer and a lower layer. And the lower layer only sends the signal, fires, only when it receives a signal from the upper layer simultaneously in time. So let's say there are multiple signals from the upper layer. This is the green one, traveling to this like upstream, downstream. So this guy only fires when, it, when these two signals come in, in the, like at the same time. And because time correlates with distance, you can now basically build, in, build a map of equal distances. And then you can set a threshold at which this, like, the system fires. And what's, what this is interesting is now you can basically build, um, so like a fingerprint, if you have an image, you can basically say, well, how symmetric is this image? Well, there you go, it's that symmetric. And uh, you can maybe do this for detection or so. Or maybe more interesting, you, you, uh, you could take satellite images. Um, and we took the Digital Globe's Worldview Satellite 2 images, uh, like data set, and they have images of trees, this is like, like, like some sort of green structures, or buildings. And each of these now tiles here, you can now run basically how symmetric is it. And naturally, a building is more symmetric than like your trees, right? So now you can basically build histograms, and you can basically see, indeed, the numbers of buildings on this y-axis correlates very nicely with the, but like, like with the symmetric density. So the more symmetric it is, the more buildings are in that image, or the more likely it is to find a building in that image. So now you can do this. Um, uh, sort of image processing very nicely with these systems. Um, how do we train these the neural network? We take data sets, we uh, use these uh, TensorFlow and Keras and PyTorch software framing frameworks. We do um, backpropagation, gradient descent. We upload the weights on the photonic engine. We take the input data, un unseen data, and run it basically in interference mode and get an output. The problem is that these tools do not understand photonics. And do not, they do not know what's my quantum efficiency or my noise, my physical noise. So we built actually in photon flow um, and actually in, uh, in simulation engine now that can actually take these uh, modeling part into account by doing this training. Yeah. And basically then we use this photon flow to basically show indeed when you build now an entire system, this is now actually a convolutional neural network processor um, based on Vinograd, but let me skip that for now. And this is an interesting system because we now not just, comp not just use the photonic processor, we actually did the entire I.O., meaning the input, output, the optical and electrical output of this entire system. And we actually found that if you have this entire system, the, the, the only the photonic processor itself, this is the numbers of giga samples per second per watt, is extremely high. But when you add the I.O., it drops by about a factor of 10. So the I.O. actually costs you. And that's something I think as a community we should not, not neglect, yeah? like the, the I.O. 2 and photonic processor. Um, you can also consider all optical neural networks. So um, here is now an, 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 an version that we published recently where we're actually now investigating an, an, an all optical um, uh, system where we never convert back to electronics. Um, we have like basically weight shifters here. This is now a phase sensitive system and we now um, can use these simply these combiners to, to do the summation. And the nonlinear activation function we do, for instance, in this case, we use actually a quantum dot coupled to two nanoparticles, which has an EIT-like strong interactive system. If you look at this math uh, here from Matt Pelton's uh, PRB paper or the, like, like this, uh, this, this response curve, uh, it takes about one microjoule per square centimeter of power. And, but the system is extremely small. This is like, this is like simply 50 nanometer, uh, like in, like in uh, dimension. Now we can integrate this here on this photonic waveguide. If you now integrate, if you now multiply this power with this dimension, basically you end up with something that's on the order of like 10, 1 to 10 atom mag per coulomb. Uh, atom mag per, uh, oh, sorry, 1 mag per atom per, per, per atom joule. So it seems to be pretty efficient. And again, the delay of the system is simply given by the time of flight of the photon through this entirely basically passive system now, yeah? Um, 
and we can do run uh, like training algorithms and we can find how good it is. Good, and then the last topic is like free space convolution processors. So um, I, I found this paper here in the past about these Gedanken experiments, kind of amusing. Um, so one can, for instance, run uh, these, one can say, what well, is Heisenberg? And Heisenberg means has, you can have so many states in a little tiny volume. That relates to an entropy, and then you have Landauer, and then you can have basically how many uh, st uh, compute states do you have in one kilogram of the universe? <laughs> That's interesting. You can do this. Uh, it's similar, we, we did something similar in this or in our proposal recently. I was saying, okay, if you take a lens, this is, which is, has a uh, focal length of 15 uh, uh, millimeter, and has a 15 uh, millimeter diameter, it basically has an optical latency of 0.1 nanosecond. Uh, then you can basically fit 50 million pixels on this sort of area at, let's say, this wavelength, which gives you a throughput of 300 petahertz. If you now modulate each of these pixels at 8 bit, basically the results will be 2.4 exabits at a volume of 5 micrometer, uh, 5 centimeter cube. Sounds great, but I would caution us as a community not to confuse maybe in terms of engineering system, realism with what's potentially real, like actually possible. Um, so now we, are looking, we looked into this um, uh, 4F processor. The idea basically have, have a coherent source. Um, you uh, load an image onto your optical beam. You uh, go through an, into, into Fourier domain. In the Fourier domain, like you have an, like a filter, like a mask or a matrix multiplier. You go inverse Fourier domain with a lens, which is all passive, of course, and you have a camera which simply images the entire system. And um, with this, you can also conceptually build like sort of deep neural networks, as like shown by the Ozan group recently, by having these filters and basically have now you like simply pass your light through, and this basically is an, actually like a convolutional network now. But imagine I want to replace these filters now. Uh, well, if I can do it by hand, it takes well, like rather long time, so it's kind of like slow. Uh, and yeah, here's for instance an example. You can have an image. You have a little uh, basic opening here, and you can basically now get edge detection now. Um, so you can do this convolutions now. So convolutional network is really the feature extraction. It's, it's, it's a device that basically um, tells you, you know, uh, some features of your of your data set. A GPU is good, but it scales not very nicely. It scales with order of n squared, where, where n is numbers of multiplication. So it's kind of power hungry. And again, in, in photonics and optics, we can use um, this, basically, we can do it by order of n. And if you look at this math here, this is simply basically using the distributive law that we learned in seventh grade, remember in high school? Yeah, you can simply factor this basically out. Yeah? This is basically how much simpler it basically is. And in addition, we use like, uh, this display technology with a very high parallelism. So let me show you the system. So here's an initial system where we simply send light in, we load an image, and indeed, we can filter this and basically like, do edge detection on this, on this system. So I call this generation 0.5. So now we move to generation one. Generation one is where we actually now have um, here at these inputs, at these signal inputs, we basically have now spatial light modulators. And I can basically now have 1,000 pixels, 1,000 pixels squared, gives me a throughput of 10 to the 12 at 60 hertz, uh, gives me 250 teramics per second. So this is actually a really parallelized processor now. Now the delay, of course, is not great because this is slow. It's like 60 hertz, right? So we, so we limit it to like tens of milliseconds. But I can replace these SLMs now with DMDs, with digital mirror displays, which clock basically at um, at 10 kilohertz at one bit, or at uh, at higher bit resolution at um, at one kilohertz. So I can speed up this whole process by really by a factor of 10 to 100. Um, now this, of course, for those who are around the block, you know that this is something nothing new. We had this exactly already back in the 80s. Um, so what's new now? And my, I have actually two boring answers to this. The one answer is why we did not have this. So this SLM, this is an idea we have already we're doing in the 1980s. The first answer is um, the I.O. of this processor is on the order of like tera max, uh, teraflops per second. This is something we did not have in the 80s. You, in other words, you could not feed this processor fast enough. Number two, CMOS was good enough. So why, why need, why build something? So there's actually no demand yeah, for processing. Here's our generation two, and generation two is a processor now that actually speeds this entire system up to 20 gigahertz now. So now we're looking at Petamax pro processor, even at a lower like pixel density. And the idea here is actually we send both the signal and the reference signal front end, and they're both convoluted in the Fourier domain together. And meaning I can, I can modulate these signals basically with any high-speed electro-optic modulator at 20 gigahertz, no problem. So now the convolute in this, in, this, in this domain here, here I basically can simply have a uh, remodulating array, like it is in, in it's like a silicon photonic chip, which is basically phase stabilized. We have like MZIs to do that. And this system now basically has an entire delay of only nanoseconds. So this is like a quasi near real-time processor. So now for generation one, a parallel processor, but slow. And generation two, have a fast, but not so many pixels per like, like processor. So for instance, if my signal is in the optical domain, let's say like this camera here, I can really do it basically, let's say, super resolution filtering or synthetic aperture radar technologies or image tracking. If my uh, signal is in the electrical domain, 
And I could probably like, just look for a few strings, but extremely fast, let's say for RF filtering, I could for instance, look at phase, frequency, hyperspectral filtering, or wavelet or so. So this is something actually I talked with AR4L, and they're very interested in, this, in, the, like, in these directions. We also got some um, funds recently from NSA to now use, uh, to build a larger system to actually do Montgomery multiplications. So this is something that's extremely important for um, public key cryptography. And you basically want to execute this, this formula here, and you basically build a larger system now uh, where we have multiple of these 4F systems, and you have uh, like adders here, basically like these, uh, these beam splitters. And you can basically build now very like 16-bit like um, diagonal results um, with a fairly like, very high good resolution. Good. So with this, I'm at my end. Um, so um, we uh, uh, also like to uh, file patents. I heard this uh, at UA here. You, uh, you like to file a lot of patents, which is great. Um, so um, I, we also filed about 17 here. I licensed one to an, uh, I'm not supposed to say to whom, but a leading South Korean manufacturer. <laughs> so that was, that was nice. Yeah, so in summary, we talk, I, I introduced some sort of these Atto Joule or new um, uh, physics inspired, new material, heterogeneously integrated um, devices and systems. Um, we built now a neuromorphic photonic processors, um, particularly important for very short delay. Some analog processes like, such as these like PDE solvers. Um, here's like this Metatronic example, and this is like the circuit board of this ENZ ITO board. Or these like RF and um, very fast um, uh, like image processors, or potentially also like RF processors. So I really believe that integrated photonics is a nice, connects you know, these worlds of electronics, photonics, and RF nicely. And I think there are really nice opportunities um, in, like, in this like, order of one towards, towards real-time processors. Um, and lastly, I'd like to invite you um, to um, submit maybe your, your, your latest work to our journal. Um, um, this is actually like Federico actually funded this uh, several years ago. I took now over as editor-in-chief a few years ago from him. And um, if you're interested, so we can publish it with us. It's an, it's an open access journal. So thank you very much. <laughs>